Good morning and welcome to this, the 20th meeting of 2014 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off? Um, this morning we have apologies for, from Jamie McGregor and in his place today I'd like to welcome Gavin Brown to committee and we also have apologies from Claire Adamson and I'd like to welcome David Torrance to committee today. Welcome. Um, the first item on the agenda is a decision to take um, agenda item four in private. Um, a committee content to do that? Yeah. Yeah. And also any future consideration as well of, yeah. of an approach we need to get that agreed as well. We also need agreement that the future approach to the TTIP paper is um, considered in private. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Agenda item two takes us on to the draft budget 2015-2016. I'd like to welcome this morning a very well-coordinated Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, who is the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs, and with her today is Ian Donaldson, who is the Deputy Director of International Division of the Scottish Government. Welcome both of you to committee this morning. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I believe you have a, an opening statement. Yes, uh, convener. Thank you. Just a very short statement. Uh, thank you for inviting me to address uh, you on the 15-16 draft budget. Obviously, this past year has uh, seen a great international interest in Scotland with major events. Uh, we have had uh, the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup, just last weekend, uh, the MTV Awards, and of course, all part of the Homecoming 2014 programme. We've had the independence referendum and, of course, the positive manner in which it was conducted um, and the unprecedented level of public participation in the debate um, has meant that all these events have enabled visitors and audiences around the world to see the best of Scotland. So it's again Against that backdrop of increased international opportunities that have approached the 2015-16 budget allocations, uh, in 2015-16 the Europe and External Affairs budget is expected to increase to £17.9 million. This increase is due largely to the technical transfer to programme uh, spending of uh, just over £1 million running uh, costs for the Brussels office. Uh, this, of course, will allow uh, increased uh, scrutiny of the work of the Brussels office by this committee and actually brings the way we fund the office into line with other overseas offices in Beijing and Washington. Uh, last year, when I appeared before you to discuss the budget, we agreed on the importance of increasing Scotland's profile and activity in Europe. I'm therefore pleased that we've been able to uh, embed the increases that we achieved um, in that area in the 14-15 budget into the 15-16 European relations budget. Uh, this means we'll be able to continue to expand our policy of seconding staff into European institutions, which we regard as a key way to build Scotland's uh, influence in Europe. Additionally, the major events line will also increase by 0.85 million. Uh, this funding is intended to support the work of Visit Scotland in connection with the 2015 Scottish Open uh, being played at Gullen and is part of the £1.2 million Scottish Government sponsorship for that event. The lion's share of the external affairs budget is the £9 million that will continue to be directed to helping the world's poorest countries in 2015-16. Uh, Scottish ministers continue our commitment to ensure that Scotland plays its part as a good global citizen. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by our work on international development, and our commitment is clearly evidenced by our securing a doubling of the baseline budget um, from £4.5 million to £9 million pounds between 2007-08 and 2011-12. And despite the difficult financial context you'll all be aware of, we are committing committed to keeping the international development funding at this level for the duration of the spending review and will do so again in 1516. And of course our unique model means that we provide funding for Scottish NGOs to work in partnership with organisations in the developing world on our priority areas and particularly where Scotland has specific skills and expertise, uh, for example in renewable energy. In addition, uh, we're We'll all work uh, across uh, our, our priority countries um, to focus on the key uh, objective of poverty alleviation and the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals uh, and must adhere to the principles of the Paris Declaration for on Aid Effectiveness. So, in addition to our programmed uh, international development work, the Scottish Government aims to respond where it can to international humanitarian emergencies and urgent appeals. Uh, some of that money comes from my portfolio, but part of our work is also to support contributions to such emergencies from other parts of the Scottish Budget. Uh, most recently, uh, that has helped ensure Scottish Government contributions to the international fight against Ebola, and we continue to monitor the situation in West Africa closely. 
This year, um, I'm pleased that I've been able to increase the international strategy and reputation line slightly. Uh, this budget supports international communications and marketing for all of the Scottish Government's priority countries, as well as the delivery of the government's Pakistan and India plans, uh, an area the com committee has been interested in previously. Um, the budget is also being used to deepen relationships with key countries with whom we engage diplomatically and um, economically. Finally, I am pleased to be able to maintain the level of funding for our overseas offices in China and North America. Um, our presence in these countries is a firm indication of the importance uh, we place on our relationship with these countries and the economic benefit that brings to Scotland. Uh, Karina, you, you will be aware that we want to, to make sure that Scotland is known as a good global citizen uh, with much to contribute to the world. Um, with this budget, we continue to ensure that contribution to promote Scotland's interests and identity to stay at home and abroad, and to contribute to delivering the Scottish Government's purpose and Scottish uh, economic ambitions. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for um, that very detailed and but condensed um, a, a contribution. Um, I know members across the committee have got a number of questions this morning, but I want to touch on something very quickly that, that you mentioned in your opening statement, and it was about being a good global citizen um, and maintaining the international development budget and the priorities for that being, you know, uh, one of the things that's facing us all is, is climate change. But um, if you could maybe give us a wee bit more um, in-depth uh, information on how you foresee the Climate Justice Fund working, but also um, the progress that's being made towards a new Paris Agreement in 2015 and the Global Climate Agreement. Um, uh, a couple of um, points on that. Of course, just to remind the committee that we have the International Development Fund, which focuses on a number of areas, which includes um, as part of uh, its area some, some projects, particularly in Malawi, uh, dealing with uh, energy uh, and, that can, and, and that particular area. MREAP is a very good example of one of the projects. And indeed, I, was, uh, I understand Tom's of use of the minister when he was in, visited Malawi actually saw that in practice. Uh, there's some very in innovative work happening, for example, with uh, the University of Strathclyde and different models. We have separately, of course, uh, the Climate Justice Fund. And I was, uh, you know, and I've said to the committee before, I was very keen when we established the Climate Justice Fund, it wouldn't be a top slicing of the International Development Fund. It would be in addition to the International Development Fund. And, of course, um, Scotland was uh, you know, one of, if not the uh, first country in the world to have a Climate Justice Fund. Um, and that is then managed um, as part of uh, Paul, Paul Wheelhouse's um, uh, portfolio. Uh, but what we can do is we work cross-government because a number of the areas are, for example, in water, again, an area that we've Scotland's got interest and expertise, uh, but also on, on, on energy. And in terms of the different areas that, the, that we're working on, um, certainly we're focusing on the four countries in sub-Saharan Africa in relation to the Climate uh, Justice Fund, um, particularly Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania and Zambia. Um, and, of course, there was a, a recent announcement to, on the Climate Justice Fund to extend that for another three million. So it is, it's interesting uh, in terms of the, the, what that means for, for what we can contribute. I talked about as contributing as a good global citizen. Um, Hamza Youssef is just back from uh, uh, Geneva when he was discussing some um, areas, uh, particularly in this, in, in this aspect. And there's a great deal of interest in what Scotland could contribute in this area um, and the models that we're using. Uh, my visit to Malawi, which now is a few years back, when I saw some of the energy um, projects in particular, it is about um, very, very localised, sustainable um, uh, areas. And one of the things that we did on the visit this time round um, in Malawi at the beginning of the year was uh, bring together some of the different projects across Malawi so they could see what each other are doing as well. So a lot of what we're doing is obviously you know, sharing our expertise from here, but it's also about making sure we've got that sustainability as well. And in terms of um, the Emery project, we think that that's been, uh, had a reach of about 20,000 in Malawi in terms of impact on, on people. Um, what was the second, the second part of your question was in relation, sorry, to the, the Global Climate Agreement and uh, how, how the Scottish Government's involved in that? On the, uh, on the Global Climate Agreement. And, of course, in terms of, of that, uh, again, Paul Wheelhouse is a, a lead on that. Um, he's recently been in Argentina. Um, we hope, again, he'll take part in these uh, areas. It's one of the areas where, in terms of our relationship with the United Kingdom Government and representation at some of these international 
um, global climate um, conferences that you know we play a key role and we're seeing as a very supportive and, and productive partner in that because we are recognised as having that expertise. The fact we've got world leading climate change legislation um, and that our targets are and indeed our delivery compared to other countries are very strong and obviously clearly with this week's announcements from uh, China and the US you know the agenda is continuing and pressing and where we have expertise within our country and where we have political leadership and where we can uh, work with others including the UK government in terms of some of these conferences uh, we will continue to do so again perhaps that's an area if you have interest that it's not my portfolio or the budget that I'm responsible for but I think one of the areas the committee has been interested in is how we work across the different portfolios to deliver on the objectives, which are not just our objectives, but clearly internationally as well. When I had my visit to, to Malawi as well, the, one of the pressing issues there was, you know, the impact of uh, climate change and the impact that then has on, you know, the ability to grow food, the ability to, um, you know, um, maintain sustainable uh, food sources and things, so it was always very important that the two things, you know, overlapped and and helped each other out. Yeah, yeah. Hans yeah. Alamalik. Uh, thank you and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, just clarify one or two things for me, please. Uh, it's in relation to the international relations, and then I'll go on to international development. Um, in terms of international relations, uh, you you clearly point out that there's uh, a real term uh, sh um, cut of 8.6 per cent since 2010 and 11. And I was just wondering why we were specifically picking on those years rather than our current years to see whether we were on budget or not in terms of our current development. Uh, for example, there was a reduction in Pakistan and India marketing budgets. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, did that cut actually make a difference? Uh, are we on track, or are, are, are we finding that that squeeze was unhelpful? Uh, and how do you intend to develop that element? Uh, actually, in terms of uh, the, the, if, you, if you're comparing some of the uh, international promotion budgets, I've explained to the committee before, some of it has been actually about the shifts between departments and responsibilities, as opposed to absolute. I've managed uh, what I've said to you today about going forward, which we're looking at the 15-16 budget. I have managed to maintain that line, which I think, bearing in mind the pressures that we've got you know, um, in terms of the Scottish Government's budget over the piece, um, I think that's been a, a significant achievement to, to, to maintain that budget. Um, in terms of um, our, our different activity, we have... I mean, I'm quite comfortable about what we've managed to do. We've had our first ever ministerial visit to Pakistan this year. I mean, in terms of, again, that kind of um, opportunity to promote Scotland uh, as part, obviously, of the Commonwealth Games uh, uh, promotion. Um, in terms of a different number of activities, uh, we, some of the activities, as you know, are not just about what we do in Pakistan, uh, but also what we do to help promote the Pakistan plan here, particularly business interests. Uh, we've had a business conference um, in June 2014, which was uh, in Glasgow was hosted by the Scottish Government, uh, UKTI and the Pakistan Consulate um, to highlight the opportunities for Scottish business. And in terms, therefore, of India, um, again, as part of um, our work there, a business networking uh, reception was held in, in Delhi. Um, obviously, you'll know my keen interest in its promotion of Scotland, not just business, but education, great deal of interest when I was in India, uh, certainly. And those, you know, all those relationships are building. The tourism connections are very strong as well in terms of um, how we work, visit Scotland, work with the tourist operators in India about what we can you know, pr promote Scotland's and Scotland's interests. So I don't think there's been a pressure in particularly of what we've been able to do because of the repro any reprofiling. And, you know, when you compare our budget compared to other uh, portfolios, one, it's, it is much smaller, but the margins we're talking about are very, very small indeed. Um, one of the things that I, um, I think um, you might be interested in is how we're coordinating a lot of our messing messaging. Um, obviously, a lot of it is... Uh, traditional uh, traditional media uh, also social media become more important but one of the things that we did and uh, we will make sure that the committee gets copies of this is because we had so many different international events taking place because across the globe the interest that people have in Scotland we produced um, a suite of materials which talked about um, the different segments we had whether it's cultural life um, skills and training um, business food and drink all those areas where we had kind of core messages that 
that were, you know, whether you were directly employed by the Scottish Government or whether actually you were an ambassador um, in your own field, whether it's in business or whether it's in education, we could be using the opportunity of the world stage exposure that we're getting this year to help promote, and that's something that we will continue to do. So, uh, bearing in mind that you know my international um, a strategy reputation and promotion budget is, mar you know, is, is minuscule compared to some of the budgets we've had for the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup and all the big events we've had this year and bearing in mind even on Sunday night you, know, you had 750 million people watching an event coming from Glasgow um, you know, we're, 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 we're managing to maximise our, our impact to reach and as this committee have, has been interested in before one of the, the, the roles I have is to try and is it's like a hub and spoke to try and leverage in funding from across Scottish government in alignment with what we do. But I don't feel there's any pressure in the way you said. Yes, I would like more money in this area, but quite frankly, you know, the, the whole government I think is, is uh, has got to be very careful about its funding, and it's been very very uh, tight, of course. That's exactly why um, I asked the question: is that uh, how are we actually managing that fund? And uh, even though it's a small fund. And therefore, it becomes more crucial that we make sure that it's focused and directed and we maximize it. And this is why I was wondering uh, whether you had the information at hand or would be able to provide me with is where are we with that fund so far, about whether we are on target or not. And if we are on target, what is it we are actually doing to achieve those targets? And uh, how do we intend to develop that? I understand that we are going to look at new country plans and that, that will indicate some direction in that. But in the meanwhile, I think it's important that the little finance that is available is in fact focused. And if you can't give me that, just now, I'm quite happy to receive it by... by I, I can give you some... If you're looking for yes, the please. figures in this, um, the, uh, for the uh, Level 4 spend on the international strategy and reputation line, which you're interested in, the allocation for 15-16 is uh, 1,666,000, and that com compares to last year, uh, 1,396,000. Uh, uh, the bulk of that spend is on the line that you're interested in, which is the international communications and marketing budget. Um, that's the that source from those figures I've given you. And for 1415, um, the spend there was 1.1 million pounds. So I'm co I'm comfortable we're managing to, uh, you know, satisfy the requirements for the promotion, as well as then obviously we're going into a phase where I've explained previously that we're looking at different country plans and the international framework. Um, if that's uh, and some, the the line in fourteen fifteen was slightly down because of a transfer to help promote um, EU engagement last year, which was understandable, and I explained that previously to to the committee. The other good news I see that yeah, there's, a, there's a real increase from one hundred and twenty um, thousand to five hundred thousand. Uh, where will that additional resource actually come from? Is it going to come from other parts of your international development or elsewhere? The, I mean, it's just explained that actually what we've managed to do is just return the 1516 figure on international strategy and reputation to the kind of level it was in 1415. Yeah. 1415 had been slightly down because we'd done, we'd, uh, we'd funded a bit more in Europe to try and build up our capacity, particularly in activity there. And remember, I, I talked about the Nordic Baltic strategy and some of the activity there. So what we've managed to do is just to, to realign it. My budget goes up slightly. Remember, if you look at, you know, it's uh, it's going up slightly up to 17 million. So there is a bit. Of, of, of movement That's there. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Questions from Billy Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, Good morning. Secretary. Um, you, you gave a very positive uh, opening introduction there, which is very welcome. And I noticed the European strategy budget is being enhanced significantly. Um, could you give us a, a, a little bit more information about what that additional investment will, will bring us, particularly in relation to the work of the Brussels office? Just what, what they'll do, because I, I see that, that one of the aims is to get a bigger return on, you know, the competitive EU funding programmes and so on. How will we get a sense of that, uh, this committee, about how successful that is being? Well, it'll be over the piece, because obviously a lot of the funding rounds are, are taking place as part of them. this, uh, the multi-annual financial framework and the funding um, streams that are available now, but we're very keen to make sure that we can be as competitive as possible. And a lot of our work, you know, if you look at even the Nordic-Baltic strategy, some of the the work we're trying to do with Ireland in particular and different countries is how we can maximise our access to those type of funds that are cross, that require, you know, cross um, country collaboration in different areas. Uh, even on, on my... Uh, 
other side of my portfolio in terms of culture, archaeology and heritage, there's some kind of really interesting work that's there, creative industries. Um, one of the reasons that we've got particular interest in some of the Baltic states, uh, they're very keen to work with us on creative industries and if we can identify projects, etc., uh, before you even get to film and other, other areas. I was quite upfront in saying that the increase in the European budget um, was actually about a, a, a shift taking um, funding that would have been out of the kind of regular direct running costs of government of the Brussels office and putting it into programme budget, which makes it more, you know, it's, it's gives it um, greater visibility, I think, to committees in particular, puts it on the same uh, funding uh, model as uh, the Beijing and Washington. So I'm not pretending it's a, suddenly a, a massive increase in what they can do. It's, some of it is a technical transfer. However, some of it is. And um, there's a, a modest increase um, of uh, 115,000, particularly into the European relations area, and what I explained to you at the last you know, the last last year was we were looking to allocate funding for secondments to the EU institutions. By and large, generally, the UK as a whole is is not as strong as it's been in, um, in previous years about um, making sure we have um, experience within different administrations, either on a permanent basis or a temporary basis. I know it's something that David Lennington and uh, William Hague have spoken about at the joint ministerial committees that we have, and how do we increase that, and how do we recruit and encourage more people to want to be able to be seconded into areas, and how do we whether it's Scotland or the, or the UK government, try and get more people um, to be working within the institutions. But one of the things you can start doing is to have succumbance into the presidencies, uh, for example, and that's an area um, that we've, we've had a, a reasonable amount of activity on, particularly around whether it's environment or marine, where we've got areas of expertise, and those succumbance are, are very welcome, but they also give us a better insight in our staffing of what's going on. And again, it's part of that net networking and influence over the long, longer term. So I'm not pretending it's kind of, uh, a, you know, a very, you know, it's a, um, a massive increase in budget, but it's just, it is strategic. Um, we've got a succumbance, for example, with Latvia now, uh, obviously looking forward to the next presidency. So, um, you know, it's different institutions. Sometimes it can be commissioned, but the presidency, um, there's been a number of uh, secondments over recent years into uh, work with the EU uh, Council presidencies. How about, how about how we assess how successful we are and, and, and you know, in the competitive programmes? It was an issue that's come up yeah. over many years here with my friend and colleague Helen Eady used to raise it regularly here about how do we know we're getting value for money okay. and so on and so forth. Well, um, again, that's across government. I mean, that's across government and it's probably across parliament um, scrutiny on this. I mean, certainly in terms of the, you know, some of the funding streams is actually probably under, it'll be under the uh, capital infrastructure. A lot of the EU funding is under, you know, in terms of what we would then maximise under that portfolio for scrutiny for you know, the budgets, etc. And within each portfolio, we'll be trying to maximise that. Um, so it's something that the committee itself can take an interest in. We obviously, um, you know, obviously the successes of what we do, we want to benchmark against different countries, etc., where we are. But uh, a lot of that would not be part of my responsibilities. It would be another minister, currently Nicola Sturgeon. And in, in terms of um, you know, Scotland's contribution to Europe, in terms of the skill portfolio that we, we have particular strengths in, Cabinet Secretary, and you've mentioned quite a few of them, creative industries and life sciences, energy and so on. Do we look to Europe to see what we can learn from them to address perhaps, perhaps particular skill shortages that we may have? And I, I think particularly one that, that's close to my heart, the software engineering. We always seem to be short of software engineers in, in Scotland. And I don't know, I don't know why. Well, I could guess why that is. But do we look around to see what the experience is at a European level, what particular strengths that those countries may have, to see if we can adapt and use okay. some of their ideas for recruitment and, and encouragement for our youngsters to, to take an interest in those types of professions? I know um, the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Training and Youth and Women's Employment, Angela Constance, has had a number of visits, um, quite often with other you know, delegations, STUC and others, um, and, and business interests and education interests to different countries to see what they're doing on the employment aspects, and that's certainly what we've been, we've been looking at. Um, and in terms, I suppose, of, of recruitment, one, you have to be a welcoming country in the first place to, if you want to encourage people to come and, <laughs> and work with you. Um, and that's obviously an ongoing issue I know the committee has taken interest in. But it's but it also you've got to have a, a, a your wages levels that, that uh, attract people, uh, but also quality of life.
life um, as well in terms of attracting people into particular areas and industries. And I was very struck when I was in Krakow, a very young city, very you know in terms of the age profile. Um, I was there in the spring this year, and they work very very universities, a lot of universities there. Um, and in terms of the capacity and capability of the volume of of particular sectors that you need, and I mean we'll need in software engineering, that you know they're they've got huge increases in the number of uh, young people who are staying and stay coming to study stay study live and then stay and then are recruited by a number of co countries uh, companies many of them in the areas that you're talking about locating there precisely because they've got a large pool of um, skilled labor in the areas that they've got interest in so yes there are um, places in, that we can learn from in, in, in different areas um, and of course from our own perspective we've got uh, Scotland Towns in Brussels where we would have and host a number of areas we would bring together commissioners we've had commissioners address events in uh, Scotland House in the areas of our skills and expertise that's also a ch chance to learn from others um, in, in the areas that we, we carry out so um, one of the kind of big challenges of course is you know the po post-study visa you know and I know that in terms of uh, where we are now and looking at the Smith Commission and the interests that we've had and this committee's had post-study work visa if you look at the submissions and that have been published certainly from um, a number of, of places you know the universities are very very keen in terms of making sure we've got the brightest and the best and if they come here they stay here and they have an opportunity to contribute and pay taxes uh, uh, to our country so this is you know this is a live issue that will continue but you've got to be attractive in the first place and you've got to want people to come and come here in the skilled areas you have and to make sure that we've got you know the working age population that we need going forward thank you very much for that. Well, it's actually before I bring Rod Campbell in, I just wanted to pick up and, uh, and take that a wee bit further about um, the impact of immigration. You may have seen that the Chamber of Commerce yesterday issued a warning about uh, some of the very Eurosceptic and anti-immigration um, uh, noises that are, that are coming from, from Westminster and the impact that would then have on the, the pool of skilled labour available to um, industry and business in Scotland and I see there's been a modest increase in the budget line for immigration um, and I know that was the budget line that replaced fresh talent. Um, I wonder if you can maybe just give us some insight into why that budget line has been increased and what will it be used to achieve? Um, one of the things we do there is we work with different areas um, uh, in terms of some of it is actually working the budget then is transferred to other areas for example we work with Scottish Enterprise when we have businesses that want to come here some of the issues advice they have if they want to bring in um, uh, the the business exp experience from other countries um, in terms of the actual I'm just trying to find the actual budget budget um, lines on it um, the allocation for 1415 was 615,000 that's been increased to 700 Thirty thousand. Um, again, some of this is about in in year when we're when we're when we're dealing with very very tight budgets and when we're dealing with uh, hundreds of thousands. Sometimes we have slight movements between the budgets, um, and the bulk of the migration uh, strategy, as I said, is deliver is is um, allocated to delivery partners. So of that um, uh, funding, four hundred seventeen and a half thousand is transferred annually. We've got 150,000 goes to the local, gov local government finance to support the COSLA Strategic Migration Partnership. A lot of good work, you'll be aware, takes place with our local authority partners, helping local authorities deal with um, immigration asylum seekers and the support they provide. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this resource goes to the Scottish Enterprise, and that goes to Scottish Enterprise sponsors. There's 200, um, 267,500 goes there to support Talent Scotland's role in providing visa advice to workers relocating in Scotland um, and uh, this used to be delivered by the Scottish Government but was transferred to Talent Scotland in April 2013 because clearly a lot of companies coming to to invest in Scotland uh, will be working with Scottish Enterprise and we felt it was actually a better fit for that. The remaining 312,000 that we have um, is for migration policy development advice um, uh, and in terms of developing uh, our policy in this area. Clearly, there's been a lot of engagement across Civic Scotland and our universities in this area um, uh, in particular, and we continue to work with them. So um, I would say the marginal change, again, is uh, we've tried to obviously uh, make sure that our um, European area was supported in the last year, um, and we've got a much... I'm very pleased at how we're managing to develop that. It's a long way to go, uh, but it, we're still managing to provide what we have done in terms of that migration advice, and that's the areas that 
we do it, but the two main areas, business for incoming workers coming for, to, to help support our businesses and local authorities in relation to um, asylum seekers um, and uh, refugees. Rod Campbell with a supplementary on Willie Coffey's questions, and then Hans Aller's coming in after that. Yeah, so if we could just uh, wind it back slightly to the European strategy. We obviously had a morning, sorry, Cabinet Secretary, sorry for all that bit. Um, if we could just wind that back slightly. Um, the European strategy budget has obviously increased quite substantially over the last couple of years. You've explained some of the reasoning for that. Um, uh, obviously, last year I recall dis discussions about secondment of staff to European institutions. Could you give us a, an indication as to kind of how much of the budget is being spent on secondment of staff? In terms of um, the of that level, we reckon uh, we reckon three hundred for fifteen sixteen. We think three hundred thousand um, would um, allow us to have um, seconded posts. Um, and we're currently, um, for 14-15, it was 200,000. And currently, in terms of secondments, remember, secondments might not be cleanly financial year to financial year. It's when, you know, when it suits the organisations and institutions. Um, we've got DG Climate, uh, DG Marine and Environment, um, and also to the Latvian uh, Presidency and the IAEA. Um, and this is obviously probably a difficult one to say, but how, how do we actually measure the success of that secondment? Well, you, you, you can actually measure it by what, uh, where we are now and what we haven't done. I mean, one of the kind of challenges for the UK government and its European relations um, is that it is not as well connected as other countries are. Other countries have been um, very strong over decades of building up their capacity and capability. When I, again, uh, one of the lessons from when I was in Poland, I mean, they have a, a whole sort of college which is aimed at making sure that they, they you know, again, the brightest and best who are interested in careers um, in the institutions in Europe um, are supported and trained and well placed. Because although when people then work for these institutions, of course they're working for the institutions, but knowledge and understanding of your own country that you can bring into that, and it is one of the areas that the UK government have a, a, admitted and acknowledged that the um, over decades, and I'm not I'm not particularly blaming um, this UK government, but over for decades, they have fallen behind. Now, the, so the price of it is not, not so much how much you have to pay to, to, to start people. And the, a lot of people, they are starting on their careers. They're, you know, they're young, um, young professionals within the civil service and, and different areas. Uh, but it is, you know, over the piece, over decades, you're building up that experience. And what we're finding now, and what the concern of the UK government is now, that at senior levels within the different institutions, there aren't as many. Uh, people who've come from a, a UK background than previously been the case. So, you know, you, the value of it, you, you know, it's not special pleading. They're, they're there to serve the, the presidency. That it's not, um, it's the it's the knowledge and it's part of that kind of development of one relationships that can come good in, in future years and be helpful. Uh, you're not trying to unduly influence for selfish reasons. Clearly, you're seconded. You've got to work professionally for the institution that you've been seconded to. Um, but it's part of that making sure that people get the skills and experience that will serve them well in, in future years. But it also, as a country, we think that it will help us uh, for, for a key point when we're trying to get our message across or people to understand where we're coming from that if we have people at senior level um, across the institutions that know of Scotland and know of our background and our interests. Um, and it's what other countries clearly see as in their interest to do. And we are playing a bit of catch up on that. And that's from the UK, UK wide. And a small budget that we have and smaller numbers, we still think it's important to have that experience. And that's why we're doing this comments. It's, you know, it's not one of these things that you'll value in pound, shilling, pence or results of of um, you know, what's achieved, because remember, they are serving the institutions. And with a tight budget, do you think we've got the balance right, as opposed to kind of the freezing of expenditure in North America and China? Um, I mean, it's, or is it just simply down to a question of priorities? I'll probably refer you back to one of the questions I had about how do you measure our competitive for EU funding and the EU competitiveness. If you know, we have to engage where you know the, the access of the funding is so important for us, um, in many different areas across the uh, across the piece that we have to have, make sure we've got the capacity and capability to maximise on access to whether it's the different funding or indeed influence negotiations where we can and where you know uh, and and where we've got interest and uh, and and clearly you know this week. Again, 
again, councils are happening all the time. And unfortunately, you saw the experience this week where Richard Lockhead, who's now the longest serving fisheries minister, um, compared to any of the 20 um, member states, uh, seven years not being able to uh, speak and contribute to the, the Fisheries Council and uh, was replaced by, and it wasn't replaced, but the, the UK Secretary of State was replaced by a, a Lord um, who hasn't got, is unelected and has very little experience or knowledge or understanding. So all these aspects, supporting council meetings, supporting um, our work for um, trying to achieve funding um, is, is important. Um, in terms of um, China and, and, and the US, and I know this will be an area the committee will come back to in your forward work plan and looking about how you maximise that. Remember, um, a lot of the work we do in Brussels is actually about institution and governmental. A lot of the work we achieve in China and, and uh, the US is not directly as a result of the small but very effective team we have in these countries from the government. It's how we work with our partners in SDI, Scottish Enterprise Visit Scotland. So again, it's part of how, you know, how we maximise that. But a lot of the resource, as in people resource, that helps us achieve the jobs and, and um, the tourist numbers, etc., are actually delivered by other agencies, whereas the issue with Brussels in particular, it's very important that we as a government um, have a role, a direct um, role and influence, and that probably maybe explain the different issues around where the funding for people are, as opposed to funding for, say, advertising or communications. Or... Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just going back to international strategy and uh, repetitions and um, the, the welcome increase of 267,000 allocation. Um, and I'm just wondering, does that allocation actually enhance the engagement with Pakistan and India? And if so, uh, how would that happen? I, I, for the sake of repetition, um, I told you that we uh, funded um, business networking receptions in, in India. We promoted business conferences for Pakistan in June this year, supported by different agencies. So when you say, what are the fun what, how do we use that funding? We, we use it for... To use the increase. What, what, what other value are you going to bring to the table well, in terms um, of the additional resource? Well, we're currently planning what we'll do over the next year in terms of whether it um, will involve or not um, ministerial-led delegations um, in terms of looking at refreshing the different plans. Clearly, the budget should follow what your policy and your plan is rather than saying, OK, that's the budget and we determine now what another minister, um, Hamza Yusuf, might want to do in India and Pakistan over the next year. Even give me an indication of what else you are proposing or thinking of in developing this? Um, well, that's part of, you know, I've already told the committee that we're looking at our India and Pakistan plan. I think it's important that we actually follow what our proposals are. You know, I, I'm not cutting it. That's no, a good that, point. That, 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 <laughs> that's helpful. That's helpful. Uh, uh, I won't press you on that one anymore. That, yeah, that's, no, that, that's that is helpful. Uh, and um, other thing was, of course, uh, how we're engaging with South, uh, North America, I mean, the U.S. and in, in Canada. I'm just wondering, are there any new um, benchmarks we're going to establish on the work that we're doing there? I mean, after all, the budget, I know it's still a, a, a freeze on any a, a increase, but I'm just wondering what new elements are we going to try and introduce in, to enhance our engagement with the North American cousins? Well, um, I, th I think one of the, the major developments we're looking at is how we work across the Americas. Um, obviously, there's a particular interest in, in, in areas that are, um, and particularly in South America, that we've got interest in. Um, for example, uh, SDI have uh, opened an office in, in Rio. Um, Brazil, very interested in Scotland in lots of different ways as well, particularly around, you know, they've had the World Cup, um, they've got the Olympics. Um, I have met on a number of occasions now incoming delegations from Brazil, very interested in see how we can, we can maximise um, the cultural contribution um, of having major events. Um, so th they've been strong attenders, for example, the Culture Summit we had. Uh, we've had one after the, the London Olympics and again one after the Commonwealth Games this year. Um, so we're building up those links. Oil and gas, clearly very important. Whiskey um, aspects as well in terms of our exporting. Uh, so if, if, if you were to say, well, what will we see as a change in development? Of course, it's you know, you're making the most of our um, US uh, areas. We've seen uh, a big interest, a big increase in uh, 
investment from the US. We've seen that in terms of in inward investment, a very strong year. And again, um, the, the report to Young showing that Scotland, um, you know, outside London, has been the, the, the strongest, again, in terms of pulling in inward investment. Um, and still a very strong market for us. And we'll continue with our partners, as I said, to develop that. But if you're looking about where we're going in different directions, is how we can best do that and coordinate it across, um, across the piece. One of the areas um, in terms of... Um, what we can help facilitate, and we've seen that in Canada, is much closer working between our agencies, Visit Scotland, um, SDI, um, and the Scottish Government in terms of um, our work in Toronto, um, in terms of our location there. And of course, if you look at you know, how do we measure that, um, this year's Scotland Week was the best ever in terms of bringing jobs and investment announcements uh, were made, um, over a thousand jobs being uh, announced from, from the US. So that's a strong, strong relationship. But there are opportunities elsewhere. Um, and that's why, in terms of what I've charged our um, US team to, to our, our North America's team to look at, is to look at actually an America's work, which would also then allow us to support activity elsewhere. And clearly, again, in terms of the work of Paul Wheelhouse recently in, in Argentina, yes, it was about energy climate change area, but he also t embarked on a number of um, visits that also helped uh, develop some of our activity there. That brings me on to my next question nicely. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in, in regards to jobs and employment, one of the things that I'm noticing in my own constituency in Glasgow is that we're getting a lot of con contractors bringing people from overseas to do work in Scotland, whereas our own youngsters are not getting those opportunities. Um, now, I don't know whether this is a cost element or whether it's an agreement internationally in terms of bringing people over, but uh, in terms of immigration support and advice, uh, I'm also noticing that a lot of our uh, um, constituents are suffering due to the UK policy rather than Scottish policy. Um, how can we ease that difficult period for um, residents who are living in Scotland just now who have immigration issues? Uh, will this budget actually cater for some of that uh, in terms of advice and uh, stability for families, or is this not going to be uh, included in that? It is very challenging for the Scottish Government and the budget we have to continually have to fund mitigation of the worst problems of UK government policy, right? I'm not, you know, and, and that, that's a pressure. You see it in welfare, you see it in other areas. Um, the, we, we, our best work, I think, has been with local authorities because it's in communities. You talk about your own constituency. So where there are people who have got issues and there, there are concerns, you know, being as local as possible is really important to, to try and support that. Actually, just... Um, uh, just to reflect, I mean, last night I, I met the convener. We were both at the King's Theatre where um, British Red Cross were sponsoring the Kite Runner. Very a great performance. But they were linking it with the, the issues for um, people who have, have fled very difficult situations. And it was the, 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 that was the organisation that brought together people, um, bringing people together, families, reunited families who've been separated by war or by you know, real severe um, issues. And uh, uh, it was a, an opportunity for them to share the work that they have. So... And that's another good example of partnership. And again, they were telling me about how they work with um, local authorities, different agencies in, in that area. And obviously, again, our support. I mean, the fact that I, mean, I, I as minister, a long time ago, initiated the unaccompanied minors um, policy, which is really important for some of our young people that have come, end up coming to this country uh, under 16 and needing support. So, yes, that's a, an important area. But are you saying, can I use this tiny budget to try and mitigate some of the kind of problems that and another you know it's it's just not possible we can do as much as we can your point about young people getting jobs remember you know, meet young people your business it's everybody's it's responsibility whether it's as ministers but also as constituency msps to encourage local businesses to make young people their business that's the the program and that's the to try and get as many local young people employed as possible and i'm sure everybody in this room is trying to do that yeah it was just just to finish off, um, in terms of employment, uh, we actually see large organisations, uh, people like the Scottish Government, for example, and others, who are actually using contracts to bring employer, employers from overseas. And we have, uh, and the facts are here, I can assure you, uh, um, that the people are being employed here, uh, whereas my own constituents in Glasgow are finding it difficult to get those jobs. So. I'd be happy if you want to write to me showing the evidence very you have of that. And that. I'll be, very yeah. happy to do that. God, is it a very yes, quick supplementary yes, on this? Just on the immigration. Oh. I'm, I'm slightly confused that the 730,000 on immigration advice, really how, how that's accessed. I mean, is it kind of 
money given elsewhere, or can the general public access any of this, as it were? Um, general, uh, it's run. It, we, it's again, it's a transfer budget between. We give it to local finance who work with the COSLA. I mean, it's called, it's it's one of the strategic migration partnership. It's very long standing. I don't know if you ever. I don't know if the committee's ever taken evidence from the strategic uh, migration partnership. Karina's indicating yes, and that's that's the partners we, we fund them to, to do. The, we don't do direct. We don't, um, as a government, do direct service delivery of um, support to individuals. That's you know, we deal with strategy, policy, etc. In terms of uh, working with individuals and families, that's done by people on the ground. Um, in, and local authorities will. Some of that will be delivered themselves. Some of it they might work in partnership with the likes of. I just mentioned the British Red Cross. It might be others, other agencies in in, in this field. I was wondering if it would be a fruitful line of inquiry for the committee to explore you know, what is actually happening on the ground with this kind of advice. Yep, thank you. Okay, Alec Rowley. Thanks. Good morning. I will return to I mean, the, the point that, that Willie Coffey raised to begin with. If um, Fela Nidi is looking down on me just now, she would not forgive me if I did not. And it is the question that, that was one that Helen raised constantly, was these funding programmes and how successful we are. I know that, that Helen, when I was in local government, was constantly um, raising with me um, some of the funds and, that were available and not coming into Scotland. You seem to, when you were answering uh, Willie Coffey, Minister, you seem to suggest that it was somebody else's department in terms of the question of how do we measure the success or otherwise of the availability of European funding and, and, and whether or not that has been drawn down. How do we measure that and, and are we measuring that? Well, we will measure clearly how much can be, be drawn down in different areas, but obviously you know, if you look at even one area, and of course Jimmy uh, McGregor isn't here, but you know, in terms of the CAP funding, for example, and you know, the Rural Affairs Committee will spend extensive time looking at about what's happened in terms of the allocation of that and how obviously that's been negotiated at a total level and then this funding streams from within that. What you're asking is about the competitive funding streams which will come from individual areas. So it will be whether it's in, um, in terms of enterprise or in terms of Horizon 2020, for example, which again this committee has taken an interest in. But you know, I would ex be expecting that the, um, you know, the that's part of what the Education and Learning Directorate will look at is how competitive we've been. It's not just about looking about how you know, it's also about not waiting till after the event just to measure how successful we've been. It's trying to be upfront in trying to make sure that we're making the connections, um, particularly with small businesses in relation to Horizon 2020 and our institutions, and preparing them um, to maximise their impact and what they can get. And that again has been an area that I know um, that Michael Russell and the uh, you know, education um, area has been doing to maximise what we get from it. In terms of the monitoring um, of it cross government, it's something that I can undertake to come back to the committee and have a look about what I can provide you as a holistic collective. I think that's what I suspect the committee is getting at, is because I can't give you detail of the individual of it, whether it's enterprise or or the structural funds uh, in particular, which is obviously, as I mentioned, was um, in the capital infrastructure portfolio. But I think Alec, you know, Alec Riley's mentioning how we as a country generally, I, I suspect, as opposed to the drilling down to the detail of each and every one. But I think that's a, a good piece of work I'm happy to try and undertake. I'm not sure in terms of the maximum, the, the scale of it, it could be quite extensive. So um, it was the, your forbearance. I'll take an overview as, as to what would be maybe work, we could work, um, officials work with your clerks to, to work out what would be meaningful for you to be able to assess that. But um, it might some of that might be about how you as a committee talk to individual um, cabinet ministers about how they've maximised the European spend from their portfolio. Okay. You described this budget as a tiny budget and perhaps on the, the grand scale of things it is, but £17.9 million is still a fair bit of money. And I suppose the obvious question is what do we get for that? And I, I do know that, that the Scottish Government um, budget document does talk about increasing the level and frequency of Scottish engagement with EU institutions, including through the secondment of staff to advance our policy objectives, develop our expertise in European affairs and increase our return on EU competitive funding programmes. And it's it's really this this, this question the outcomes. If, if I mean I'll come back to that a bit 
if you look at if you look at in terms of value for money, the Scottish Government talk about national outcomes and 50 indicators, and the indicators that are related to specifically this this um, committee and this 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 budget is to mar match the growth rates of small independent EU countries by 2017, increase exports, improve Scotland's reputation. You've touched on the improving of Scotland's reputation, but I'm just wondering how do we actually value or how do we measure um, what the outcomes are um, in terms of this budget? What is it we're trying to achieve from this budget? Um, and how do we know if, if, if we are achieving them? Well, you mentioned the figure of 17 million. Clearly, 9 million of that is on international development, which is, you know, is, is not European funding or, or, or in that territory. It's quite separate. The 17 million pounds also funds offices in uh, Beijing and Washington. The European budget you're talking about, um, you know, let's remind ourselves, is 1.6 million pounds. It's not a big, it's not a big budget uh, in relation to the overall. Uh, Scottish budget by any means. So therefore, what we're doing in terms of the uh, focusing on this, the people and the staff and bringing it into programme so that you can see it's about people, it's about the advice that's provided. So I was in Brussels on, on Friday and I met, um, uh, again, met our, our staff there. A lot of them are supporting people from justice. So, for example, we've got a big issue about the European arrest warrants, opt-out, etc., around the, 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 the justice pillars, advice that's provided, um, making sure that the UK know the Scottish position, that we're obviously, you know, we have our own justice system, real pressures there. Not all of it's going to be about competitiveness in terms of funding. Some of it's about policy issues, and that's what this budget helps fund. So the, the, this budget is not directly funding... Um, um, we, we, we can help support kind of experiencing competitive funding, tendering, etc. Most of the competitive funding uh, uh, resource will be in other portfolios um, for them to then you know, allocate. Let's get this in perspective. You know, 1.6 million for a European strategy and funding is not going to then coordinate all of the activity across. Um, you know, across the uh, across the, the the portfolios of what they're doing, and for me to micromanage what Mike Russell's doing in his area or what you know John Swinney's doing in his area. I think your point, however, of trying to find a mechanism to communicate what we've done to date in terms of securing uh, competitive funding and going forward is a good one. But I'm saying, with the resource we've got, you can't expect that small budget to somehow, you know, much as if you if you want to encourage. Uh, um, the Finance Committee and the Parliament to give me far more money so I can be, you know, far more a managerial role in relation to other portfolios and their funding in Europe. I would welcome that, but I mean, that's not where we are just now. And we've got to be realistic about it. So I think we've got to keep it in perspective of how big this budget is. Is that, is that, not, is that not part of the problem in terms of trying to have some joined-up government, joined-up strategy and joined-up approach? So if there's, if there's funding out there through European funds and communities, local authorities, whoever in Scotland um, are not taking advantage of that funding and it's spread across all these different different departments. Is, is that not actually the problem? Well, it's it's been a problem for many decades um, and we're in a much better position than we've ever been before in coordinating. And a lot of time I've spent in this committee over the last five years I've been in this position is is explaining how we're be how we're better um, coordinating across government and part of the role of the staff that this budget this budget um, um, supports is to make sure that within the different portfolios across government they are far more European they have a far more European international perspective that they grow their skills and capacity and be able to either advise others to achieve funding because a lot of it comes from third is in helping universities or indeed other people to maximize the funding opportunities they can get some of it is from government trying to um, to, to get that I'll give you an example from my own portfolio uh, one of the things we're doing with Creative Scotland is we've, we're helping uh, make sure that this there's a, a funded position to maximise European funding where you've got Creative Europe and, and the media programmes have actually increased one of the few ones where there, there's more opportunities. So we can do that. But in terms, therefore, of um, how you... You know, how you either measure it or indeed coordinate it. One of the things we do is, you know, we have, again, it's about internal secondment. So we have people from justice or indeed in education or other areas who are seconded within the Scottish Government to the Brussels office 
Um, some of that's funded from my budget. Some of it I'm encouraging as much funded from other portfolios as well to get and build up that experience to become so the whole in, the whole of government becomes more European in, in its, its approach. And yes, we are much better in coordination in terms of what we do. Energy, climate change is a very good area, and um, the in terms of the strong area of participation, particularly at um, environment councils and how we can influence things. So we're in a much stronger position than we've been in the past. I'd like to be far more uh, a, a stronger position. But remember, we are a devolved administration and there are limits to what we can do and influence. And one of the things that however strong our work at official level is, unless as ministers you can influence policy and be guaranteed to have an imp and be guaranteed to have an influence in policy, that's very difficult indeed. We've tried under the last Scotland Bill to try and get a better representation um, for Scotland in, in Europe in terms of what we can influence. Uh, it's on a grace and favour basis. There's a, you know, we have a memorandum of understanding where you know, we're, we're given um, assurances that yes, we would be able to attend and that uh, ministers, UK ministers should look favourably in our contribution. That is not happening in the way it should. So therefore, you know, remember we are, you know, we will maximise what we can do as being a devolved administration, but there are challenges and any support this committee can give me, either within my influence across the Scottish Government or indeed with the UK Government to give us a bit of a stronger guarantee of what we can do um, in terms of Europe will help make more of what make more of this. For saying that with this budget that there is there is nothing really that you can measure to to say I mean you know let's 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 look at the China division four hundred thousand pound. What is it we're actually getting for that? The seven hundred and fifty thousand pound North American strategy. I know that's yeah. not a lot of money well, in terms I mean, of the bigger picture, uh -huh. but but are, are we really saying that there is you know for this budget is seventeen almost eighteen million pounds that there is no measurable outcomes that go in place that say there's what we're going no. to get this year for this budget? Oh, of, co of course not. All I'm saying is Europe is more challenging because, uh, going back to um, uh, Rod's, Rod Campbell's point, it is about how we uh, maximise our influence on the, on the institutions. It is more government to government. It is more about how we can maximise um, the different departments and what uh, within the Scottish Government and what they can um, uh, what they can achieve within Europe, working with civic society, businesses, etc. The differences, I think, with US and China, of course, we, you know, in terms of the outcomes, you talked about outcomes. The China plan that again, I've or, you know, I think I've given evidence to this committee in, in recent times when we launched the new China plan is specifically to do what you're asking is to provide benchmarks and outcomes. I know the cross party group on China, for example, I've just responded uh, to them. I'll make sure a copy comes if it hasn't already done so to this committee. Uh, they were asking about um, how what progress has been made on the outcomes that we've set it for the China plan and, and there's good progress being made in terms of exactly the tangible measures that you're looking at in terms of um, either inward number of um, students coming, in terms of the business activity that we've been involved in, how many businesses, a huge increase in the number of businesses that we're supporting in China. That's, that's the outcome-based um, aspect that you're looking for, uh, that is most evident in the China plan. All I'm saying is that there's a far more, it's a far more complex issue of how you measure the input and success on, on um, access to European funding um, f for Brussels um, than it is for China and, and the US. And it's cr cross-government. Um, Gavin Brown. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Good morning. Secretary. Um, just a follow-up question firstly on the, the European strategy. Um, obviously, the uh, cash change to that is 1.17 million, and you said in your introduction some of that is a technical transfer. I think those are the words you used, and then some of it is an actual increase in funding. And in terms of the breakdown of the 1.17, are you able to just tell the, tell us how much of it is is a technical transfer and how much of it? could be deemed to be an increase in funding. Yes, I can give you some indication of that. Um, the, so although the, the budget, there's an, an increase um, there, it doesn't reflect the additional spend on EU waste, that's what I've announced. Um, this is because uh, one, 1, and forty nine thousand, which is the estimated cost of running the Brussels office, will for the first time be included in programme spend. Um, previously, it was a direct running cost within government. Now, that, that's, the same, that's the same basis we do Washington, Beijing. I'm trying to be, I'd, I'd like to say I've got lots of more money to do more things in Europe. All I'm saying is we're trying to be more transparent about 
about how we actually fund things. But the biggest impact is from staff. Uh, and that's obviously, um, you know, whether it's the comments or whether it's um, different areas, that's why we're, we're keen to, to work on that. And it's not even just... Um, staff that are funded by this office. We also try and encourage um, funded positions from other departments as well, as I've just explained to Alex Rowley. Okay. Um, uh, a couple of members asked and also about uh, the international development uh, budget line. Um, the SPICE paper given to the committee in advance of the meeting uh, says that this budget line has been frozen at £9 million for the sixth consecutive year in 2015-16. Is that, is that correct? Um, yes, which I think is a major achievement, bearing in mind the pressures that we have elsewhere. Uh, when we came into government, the, there was a, a budget of £3 million. Um, in 7 8, it was 4.5, um, and this um, government had increased it. Um, and that's a pressure, because in order to main, even to maintain that level, in an area where um, I've had uh, reductions across, I remember I've got the kind of a broader portfolio. Um, we've we've been determined to to maintain it at that level. And um, Spice Paper goes on to say, I mean, their calculation though is between 2010 and 11, and the current budget, that would be an 8.6 percent real terms cut. I mean, do you do you accept that figure? Well, in terms of um, the, the, the real terms impact, you know, if you've got a frozen line, which we've had uh, across many of the portfolio lines, of course that's a real term. That's the problem we've got, the Scottish Government budget. If you take the Scottish Government's budget, of course, in terms of real terms, that has an impact. Um, you know, so, you know, as you know, you know, in terms of we have the... The allocation of the Scottish Bloc from the Westminster government that has been severely challenging um, in a number of areas, and we've just worked very hard to, to try and relatively protect um, the areas that are important to us, and the International Development Fund is one of them. Uh, so, but you, you accept the figure? I mean, you're not. You wouldn't. I mean, I'm just. I, I sort of like question was: Do, I, I do you? Like you don't I, know. I can give you the calculations and what the real terms impact is of that. I'm happy to return with the arithmetic of that to. to okay. To, in terms of so, in terms of then, do, do you? Speak. To, who, who decides the EEA budget? Obviously, presumably the, the cabinet secretary says, "Here is your your budget, cabinet secretary." In terms of the budget lines within EEA, whether it's international relations or anything else, is, is that your decision, or is that the cabinet? Is that John Swinney's decision as well? Or how does that? Oh, come about? well, I mean, we, we are, as you know, we run a collective cabinet, and we all sure. agree all the decisions that we we make. Um, uh, I obviously can make recommendations and allocations of what I want to see within my own budget, but I, I, I would like to emphasise that in relation to the International Development Fund budget, it's one of the areas that you know, um, my predecessors before us and um, the administration felt strongly about that fund, and I can tell you that ministers across government and in cabinet are very... Um, um, are very positive in supporting that budget where we can. And as I said, not, it's not just the International Development Fund. Remember, Climate Justice Fund, we've managed to um, secure funding from other parts of government. And on top of that, we've managed in terms of humanitarian aid to, to secure funding from health or different other areas. So although, you're, although the, what you would have sensibly say is the IDF line has been frozen, it doesn't mean that we haven't had additional spend in that area. I've just been very effective in working with my colleagues across government to... You know, to pull that in. Okay, but have, have you have you personally, at any time in the last five years, pushed for the international development not to have a real terms cut? Well, you know, to say across our portfolio, all our portfolios had real terms reductions. I mean, there's very few parts of my portfolio has not had over the piece in terms of challenges. We've just been very effective at how we've how we've deployed it. So, um, you know, in terms of the. Uh, the allocation. Of course, I'd like to have an increase in that area, but it would be at the expense of other areas. Um, and you know, it's like even even the European strategy. One of the things I did as part of my Euro, you know, European work was to meet with um, uh, Commissioner Peebalgs, who used to be the Energy Commissioner, then had been the International Development, talking about what we were doing in Malawi and the pro and, and the, how we went about working with NGOs. So you can actually use other parts of your budget to maximise what you're doing with the International Development Fund budget, um, and also with um, external partners as well. So you know, it's it's about maximising the space so, yes, would I like to have uh, a Scottish Government bu uh, budget that's bigger, um, that would allow us to expand the International Development Fund? Yes, if this, um, this, that might be an argument this committee wants to make. But, you know, I, I have hopefully in 
over the years that I've been coming to this committee and reporting on what we're doing in this area is don't assume that a nine million budget is all we spend in terms of areas related to international development. It's actually more, the actual spend is more than what's in the, the, than the budget line would say. So, okay. well, my last question then is, is this, how do you, you basically said you, 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 your hands were tied, we couldn't have done more than, than the nine million over the last five years. How do you square that though with another part of the Spice paper, page two, which says, during the financial years 2010-11, 2011-12 and 2012-13, uh, there was a consistent underspend uh, within the uh, EEA budget uh, of around £1.5 million a year. In terms of um, areas of, of, of you know, managing budgets, a lot of it is we have programme budgets where we have to have drawdown of funding. Now, by and large, we try and make sure that we're making the most of that, but that can then move from year to year in relation to, you know, you have three years. We're now moving to, and that's one of the reasons, actually, we're moving um, to more... Um, stable three-year funding in relation to some of the programmes for the international development. Uh, but some of that has been because not all of it is drawn down by the organisations at the time during that financial year. But you can maximise. I mean, for example, um, we have a programme with Sport Relief, uh, which is match funding, um, which we have contributed, and we've actually then increased our um, spend in these areas by it's a match funding 50-50. So though we will put one million in, and that's match, I think the level... Um, the support relief one is is two and a half million. So we've actually managed to make our budget go further by partnering with different different bodies. That's a very good example of it. And so that's a very you know if you take that in terms of your real terms reduction in terms of um, having a frozen budget, uh, that frozen budget is one that other people in the sector, particularly NGOs, are very pleased that we've managed to you know to keep and maintain when other other lines are are being reduced. And not only that, we've introduced the climate justice fund and we've managed to work with partners like Sport Relief, and when you're talking about two and a half million um, in, in terms of what we managed to, to, to leverage in that partnership relative to a nine million budget, I think that's effective management of that budget. Finally, Cabinet Secretary, to just bring all of this together, one last quick question is how much of an impact on all of the work that the Scottish Government does and all of its budgets and all of its match funding would an in and out referendum in Europe? How much trouble would that give this Scottish Government? Well, I would say it's a million, million dollar question, but I think it might be the billion dollar question in terms of um, the proposal. I have said to this committee before, in terms of my visits, whether it's in America um, or uh, further afield, or indeed in Europe and European capitals, the in out referendum has. Uh, more concern than anything that's happened to date in terms of constitutional change in Scotland. Um, and it is very important in terms of jobs and services um, that we have, uh, you know, we have and continue membership of the European Union. It doesn't mean that Europe doesn't need to be changed or reformed. Um, I've published in August, which again I've talked to the committee about our programme and suggestions for reform. We think reform can take place from within the current treaties that they don't need change. I've seen evidence, and you'll have seen evidence of the balance of competence review that we are taking place, uh, taking part in, along with the, the, well, the UK government has asked us to take part in that. And if you look at the evidence from that, the vast majority of that evidence shows you that you can have reform without requirement for treaty change. Um, I, but I, I hope that everybody will work very hard to, to ensure that the UK government, um, uh, you know, if there should be a referendum, uh, ensures that we uh, continue membership and quite clearly i think it's the interest particularly our exporting base the you know the jobs the hundreds of thousands of jobs that are dependent um on uh, eu exports um, in terms of uh, making sure that our place is there i think it's absolutely as the uh, as the deputy first minister set out that uh, should there be any e in out referendum in the future um, that that would not be actioned if one of the family of nations, i.e. Scotland, uh, voted to remain in Europe. And I'm very pleased that over the piece you've seen an engaged and informed electorate increasingly in Scotland, recognising that, the, that it, it continued membership is the right thing to do. I would add that I've been speaking to some of my colleagues in Ireland and Wales who have the uh, exact same fears too. Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you for, for your time at committee this morning. Um, as usual, we went over time a wee bit with your contributions, but we always welcome that. We always know you're very flexible in, in that, that point of view. And um, uh, uh, delighted to have you uh, back at committee and hope to see you again. Um, 
I'm going to suspend committee briefly for five minutes for a quick comfort break. Um, if people can be back in their seats by 10.30, that would be excellent. Thank you.
the external relations committee. Our next agenda item is consideration of the Brussels bulletin, which you have in your papers. Um, I'd like to invite members to make any comment, questions on the Brussels bulletin. Rod Campbell. Could I just comment? It's, really, it's a comment more than a question, really, on the, the poverty and social exclusion section under health, sport and social affairs at the kind of quite frightening statistics, 122.6 million in the EU were at risk of poverty or social exclusion. But unfortunately, what that paragraph doesn't really move on to is to say what steps are being taken to alleviate that. But it's a comment more than a question. OK, is it something you want to investigate? Uh, well, I, I suppose it's a general question. I'd be interested in really uh, what... Um, um, all the institutions in the European Union are proposing to do about those kind of fairly frightening figures. Okay, I think there's some um, work on in the Europe 2020 strategy on that, so maybe we, have, we can have a look at that at another time. Yeah. Uh, and Chair, Chair, yeah, um, I made a comment about colour uh, in the last meeting. Are we just using up the stationery that we have, or is nobody bothered to note the comment that I made to try and save the planet and not use? Colour. Um, Has somebody got a comment for that? I think this is the format the, the, the Parliament of, obviously um, um, sure we what we want to do is make sure our, our things are interesting and, and eye catching and easy to read. So, so um, it's okay to use the planet's resources and extra money. We're not impressing anybody. This is just an internal paper, surely. Is, is this is this an issue or is I mean we can do it in black and white the next please, time. Please, yeah. I'd, I'd appreciate that. Okay, well, I coffee. Can, you, can I come back to that issue that Rod Campbell raised there on the poverty issue? If if you if you look at some of the figures, they're actually pretty frightening. In 2010, according to European Union's own stats, there were 80 million people. In, in their terminology, at risk of living in poverty and social exclusion. Now it's 122 million. But the European Union target, according to a European Union document I'm looking at here, is to reduce by 20 million over the next six years. That it hardly seems ambitious, that, given the extent of the problem. Um, I'm not absolutely certain what our role in this might be, but I'm certainly interested in it and seeing what, what we might be able to do as a committee to get some kind of handle on this. I mean, I, I know the European Union has strategies and initiatives to try to tackle this, but I get the sense that I would like to know a wee bit more in depth of what's going on, what these initiatives actually may be, and how, and obviously how we can influence them a bit, yeah. a bit perhaps a bit greater than we have to date. If, if you look at the UK, I mean, it says there in your own paper, in the Brussels Bulletin, that 24.8% of the population is at risk of poverty or social inclusion. Many of them will actually be in poverty, never mind being at risk of it. So, even at some future stage, perhaps at the committee, if there's a broader paper on, on poverty issues and how that impacts in the communities, not just in Scotland but throughout the European Union, I'd be very interested to, to do a wee bit more work on that. Yeah. Well, it is, it is embedded in the Europe 2020 strategy, so it is something that we can we, we, we ought, you know, ordinarily look at in the committee anyway, but it's certainly maybe an area that we can focus in on yeah. um, to see what, what what there is. I don't know if there's any briefing or anything out there that would help inform. Yeah, Poverty Alliance, yeah. Uh, I believe the Poverty Alliance have done some work on this, so maybe we should get a hold of their briefing and have a look at that and see if it's an area then we can focus on in the committee. Uh, and, uh, and further to that, convener, I mean, we know food banks have expanded ridiculously you know, in the UK. And I don't know what the position is in the European Union in relation to food banks, whether the, the, it's the same problem they're experiencing there. Um, and it's all obviously connected to that issue about poverty. So I'd be very interested in any kind of perspective, European perspective on this issue. Yeah, well, we can check, see what the Poverty Alliance has got Thank you. and take it from there. Thanks. OK. Any other? Alec Rowley. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with that, with all these points. In terms of employment, skills and education, if I can maybe pick up on a couple of points there, there is this work-related stress and, and the links to the economic downturn. 
I mean, I'd be interested in getting a link to that to that report. Um, in this country, one of the issues, for example, in the public sector, is where where, where you've seen, um, in some cases, thousands and hundreds of thousands of jobs <coughs> being lost, um, but the same level of work continuing, and therefore the the pressures on those that are left, in many senses, um, and although although in the public sector, by and large, there's been very few compulsory redundancies. Um, people leaving are not being replaced. People going on a voluntary redundancy basis, and there, there is, there is, I think, evidence, um, anecdotal, that I'm picking up that that the level of work-related stress and mental illness um, that that is that is, that is um, on the rise, and there is this this uh, mental health first aid programme that I know the Scottish Government were supporting, but I did ask a question whether there was any mental health first aiders programmes within within this this establishment and, and elsewhere, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of that. So I would I would like to have a further look at this um, if I could. And the other area. Is, is, is in terms of adult education and this online platform. Um, I, I know that the TUC, for example, were, were involved in a number of European pilot projects around this, yeah. and I just wonder what can kind of involvement have, have, have we got in Scotland in terms of this, 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 this programme that's described here and the online platforms that are being used. Um, and could we get some some research done in terms of any programmes that we are involved in with in terms of adult education? I'm sure many of our colleges are. Yeah, I think we could look at some of that. Certainly, we can look at what the, if the education committee's done any work on that as well. Um, and we should raise um, specifically with the education committee. Uh, some of these issues that, that you've brought up. There's a debate this afternoon, as you'll know, on um, a better workplace employee practices um, and the, the work that the, the trade unions have done for many years to alleviate and work stress, um, whether it's you know the actual uh, experience in your workplace or the experience of changes to jobs and things like that as well. So there's probably a good bit of work here, but it'd be worthwhile having a look at that. That report, which is improvement of living and working conditions, Eurofound. Yep. Any more, Rod Campbell? <coughs> Just a kind of general comment on uh, the EU budget section and the UK government's additional payment. Um, I'm assuming that in the next edition of the Brussels Bulletin, we'll get at least a, a European take on where they think we are with that now. Um, when is a rebate not a rebate? No. When it's an abatement, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Happy with the Brussels Bulletin. Happy to ensure that our, our committees get sight <coughs> of it. Um, raising specifically with the Education Committee some of the issues that Alec Rowley has suggested. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, that means we are moving on to Agenda Item 4, which we agreed to take in private. So I'll suspend the committee briefly to allow us to go into private.